Welcome to Basketball Network. My name is Harry, and today we have a very special guest for you. We'll be talking with European basketball legend and Hall of Famer Dino Raja. Dino, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Good to be here. Great. Uh, let's start with your hometown of Split and Yugoplastica, where you won two European championships in uh, 89 and 90. Uh, can you perhaps highlight your favorite moment during your time in Split? <clears throat> Definitely 89 Munich game, Final Four actually, was uh, probably the highlight of my, of my career because that was the period when we were young kids, 20 year old, 21, 22, me and Tony and uh, pretty much, um, you know, un un unknown. On a, on a world market and um, playing against uh, huge European teams, uh, Barcelona and Maccabi, with a lot of Americans, um, it was just an unbelievable achievement. And uh, uh, as I said before, the, the highlight of my life. It's amazing. Basketball. And in a recent uh, in a recent interview, you went on saying that uh, Split Yugoplastica is uh, the best European club of, of the 20th century. Uh, what was it like being 22, 23 years old and on top of Europe two times in a row? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, we didn't realize back then um, anything. Uh, but looking from today's distance, um, I can honestly say that uh, we were like you know Beatles because uh, everywhere we came uh, the, the arenas were full and people were cheering for that for us you had some booze but very little you know when you play some finals okay you get some booze but normally people were welcoming us uh, in, in Belgrade in Sarajevo in Ljubljana everywhere in, in Europe we go because we play, we play good basketball. We play, you know, basketball, basketball, not, um, you know, uh, heavy weight uh, boxing match or uh, some run and gun uh, game like like you face today with no defense. Um, we play good basketball, and uh, people like um, like to see us. And they saw some, you know, innovations because uh, before us. Uh, you could not see the big guy put the ball on, uh, on the ground. And you had me and Tony who, uh, of course, him more than me, but uh, you had the guy who was uh, two meter 10 who ran like a guard. And uh, you had a guy who was uh, two meter nine dribbling the ball uh, like, a, like a point guard. So it was, um, you know, breaking rules, kind of, uh, you know, innovation basketball. So people like it and uh, watch it and follow us a lot. And uh, we, we were recognized, you know, all over the world. Exactly. And uh, most people actually don't know that uh, your hometown of, hometown of Split is one of the sportiest cities in the world, you know, with a population of barely 2,000 uh, 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 200,000 people and the total of 75 Olympic medals. It's probably, you know, per capita, the most sportiest in the world. You know, is it, is it the food, the mentality, the sea? How do you, how do you explain this? Crazy mentality. <laughs> definitely, definitely crazy mentality and, uh, and a good, uh, good school. You know, we had a good basketball school, good coaches. And um, not only that, uh, in other sports too. But definitely, I think some piece of crazy mentality has uh, something to do with it. Um, Yugo Plastica was crowned champions of Europe three times in a row. So there was a three-peat in uh, 89, 90 and 91. Uh, in your opinion, could have that team uh, played? I know this is a what if, but could have that you know, team played in the NBA? And how would it fare against some NBA teams? Uh, there was an exhibition. Uh, with Denver Nuggets in uh, 89 and you guys barely lost that game and the net, you know Denver Nuggets played in the playoffs that year you know I, I don't think that's uh, that's possible to know because uh, different kind of preparation different kind of uh, building the team different kind of things are happening when you play you know 100 games a season or you play 50 games a season 
and um, I don't think we would be you know on the top, but I don't think even that we will be on the bottom of the of the, of the league. We will be uh, like mid range team, but of course uh, you know you do some helping and different thinking, and you know with some experience, I think we would be even better. And, um, but yeah, it's a lot of, you know, what ifs. A lot of what ifs. Uh, yeah. may, maybe with some weight room, it would be a bit easier. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, when I went uh, first in, uh, in Boston and uh, I start going with that philosophy, they are stronger, I have to be strong. But then I realized that uh, uh, with the uh, muscles uh, come less speed. And then I realized that as much as I work in, with, uh, in a weight room, you cannot beat these natural, powerful people. So I, I went back to using my speed as a, um, as a weapon. So I, I get back to my uh, weight uh, that I was before and I work on my um, agility and uh, I work on my my speed so um, I gave a lot of problems to, to people uh, with that because they they were not used to big guys you know being able to run as much as I did and um, and be able to you know to, to put the ball on the ground and do different things mm -hmm. um. After Yugoplastica, you actually uh, signed with Virtus Roma and became one of the best paid athletes in Europe, uh, making more money than Diego Maradona in Napoli. May he, may he rest in peace. Um, yeah. Well, what did you buy with your first check? <laughs> believe, believe. Uh, first thing I bought was a watch. I, I remember it. It, it was... Uh, a watch that cost about, uh, I don't know, 400 euros <laughs> of uh, today's money. So, I, you know, I, I, I was born and raised with a regular working family. So I was never, you know, um, overwhelmed with money. And um, I said, of course, I did my share of stupid things, buying uh, a certain unnecessary crap. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, basically, you know, I'm, I was never, you know, overwhelmed with the money. I was always, um, you know, run by challenge, by winning, by, you know, that stuff, not, uh, not by, you know, things. Makes sense. Um, you were actually drafted in, 19, in, in, in 89 by the Celtics. Uh, but ended up playing uh, for Boston a couple of years later in 93 due to some legal issues with Hugo Plastica. Um, would, would have playing with the iconic Celtics, Bird, McHale, Parrish, uh, Johnson, have, a, have had a different impact on your career, perhaps? Probably not. Probably not, because uh, the way I was, I was set in my head... Um, is work, 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 and um, I would succeed in any kind of sports and any any kind of matter in my life because that's the way I I am in my head. I, I always wanted to be the best, and I always did whatever uh, my coaches asked me to do to be the best. And um, of course, playing with those guys uh, would be helpful to be able, you know, to win more games, but. Um, uh, I learned one thing in my life, you don't cry over things that you cannot mm -hmm. change. So if it's raining outside, it's raining, it's foggy, it's foggy. If it's sun, it's better, but you cannot get upset about things that uh, you cannot change, especially things that happened in the past. You can learn from some things, but uh, if I have to, to draw my career again, um, Basically, maybe one year earlier leaving leaving Rome, but everything else I I wouldn't change much. What about uh, staying uh, another year or a couple more years in the NBA? Because I know that you were actually. I, I, I wanted to stay. I wanted to stay, but uh, I land up in a situation where uh, the new management of the Celtics uh, wanted to get rid of everybody, basically. And uh, they want
wanted to trade me to Philadelphia. Back then, Philadelphia was even worse uh, than us. So the one thing I was sick about in uh, in an NBA was uh, losing mentality and not caring mentality. Because when you lose games, uh, I uh, I used to get pissed off and. Mm-hmm. They go in the bus, they go in the plane, they play cards, they, they laugh, they tell jokes, and uh, I was not built that way. Mm-hmm. So going from that situation to in a worse situation was not the option for me. I wanted to go back uh, in Europe, find a team that uh, is going to fight for something. And uh, mm-hmm. I liked it in Greece. I, I loved it in Greece. It was per perfect situation. I uh, overturned the team that was, you know, lo- lo- losing team into into the winning team and. Uh, Anatinaikos, yeah. Yes, and after after I left, uh, that team continue, you know, to to be better and better. And uh, now, if you look at the history, in the last 20 years, that team is probably the most, uh, you know, legendary team. Mm-hmm. And they have to build that team, and that's my legacy. Uh, uh, that's something that you know I enjoy doing and uh, you know you know winning games there's no better uh, medicine than, um, than than winning the games uh, because exactly because uh, you know from from the aspect of I don't know some kind of NBA analyst when you look at uh, your stats your career uh, especially your third season with the Celtics you had great numbers you had uh, 20 and 10 practically all-star numbers and then all of a sudden you're gone so <laughs> you're gone gone from the league but i would imagine that you know salaries back then in europe were comparable to the uh, to the nba so uh, i was never, i was never driven by money the the only day that i told my agent uh you get me the best possible deal was when i went from split uh, to rome because in in that case you go from basically Making peanuts to making millions of dollars. Yeah. Millions, and uh, I told him I'm going with whoever offers me the most money. After that, I went from Rome to Boston for uh, less than half the money I had in, in, in Rome, and then That's crazy. And I came to Panathinaikos. I get I get less again, and then after my first year uh, in Panathinaikos, I get offer from uh, FS Pilsen that was twice as Panathinaikos offer, and I didn't want to go because I felt good in Greece. And then I went to Zadar for, you imagine how much Zadar can pay <laughs> to, to, to Panathinaikos and Olympiakos. Because I, when I heard the fans went cra- crazy, um, you know, I, I couldn't uh, say no to them. And uh, then I went back home. My last year I played for zero. So I, after my first contract, I, I never, was driven by money. Um, during a recent podcast hosted by Shaquille O'Neal himself, he mentioned you as one of the toughest white centers he played against. Uh, you know, that's a really, really great accomplishment, especially coming from uh, the Shaq himself, knowing that he's not the kind of guy to applaud his opponents uh, very often. What were those matchups with him like? You know, I was... Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I was always a smart player, uh, and uh, when you play Shaquille O'Neal, you cannot go and fight with him because you're losing that. And um, you have to u- use your speed, but you cannot use your speed if you cannot shoot from outside. And I could do both of those things. So I gave him a lot of problems because uh, when he let me shoot, I shoot and I made them. And then when he comes close, I, I go by him and he couldn't... Uh, he, he, couldn't stop me so that uh, my third year we had like five games against them and I averaged like 27 against uh, Orlando wow and uh, definitely he remembers that <laughs> uh, and, and you no know, guarding him me it's never one one job it's always uh, doubling two, tripling three against one because otherwise uh, he's gonna eat you for breakfast <laughs> uh, Actually, the, the, the post-Jordan era uh, saw the rest of the teams evolve around the great uh, MVP caliber centers like uh, Shaq, uh, Hakim Olajuwon, Patrick Ewing, David Robinson. Which one of uh, those centers was, was your toughest matchup? Maybe Shaq or somebody else? 
you know, there are different guys. Um, Shaquille was unbelievably strong and, uh, and, and movable. He, but he was not dangerous outside of the paint. And uh, Olajuwon, he was, you know, full package with his uh, fakes and quickness. And he was not that tall, but he was so quick and he knew basketball so well that uh, he was unpredictable and very, very hard to guard. Uh, then you had uh, David Robinson, who was a little light, and um, uh, Ewing also much lighter than this, than, than Shaquille O'Neal, but they had their own, you know, qualities, uh, all-star qualities. But, you know, different players, uh, you have to watch them, see what they're doing, and then you try to stop uh, their best moves and you cannot stop all of them, but uh, you, you you get help and you try to stop what you see is their, you know, uh, trademark move and then you make yourself, uh, make your life easier during the game. But uh, th those guys, you can, you know, you can not stop one, one on one. Mm -hmm. um, you played through perhaps the most physical era in uh, NBA history, the 90s. Uh, many would argue the NBA today lacks uh, that sort of physicality. What do you think? I uh, had my son tell me the other day, did you look, don't you? Did you look, don't you? Oh, what a thing he did. And I said, did you look? He said, of course. What do you mean? I said, okay, come, let's see that. Because I know what he was uh, referring to. And then we saw this play, and this play is like seven, eight seconds, nine dribblings, three fakes in the paint, and nobody comes for help. And I tell him, look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine dribblings. He stopped, one fake, second fake, third one, he takes a shot. In my days, in the paint, you get killed. <laughs> you get killed. You yeah. get certain, yeah. uh, certain Barclays, Oakleys, uh, Masons, uh, Lambiers, and those guys. They cut your head off. If you, if you fake them and you go underneath them, you'll be sure that your head is going with the ball uh, away from your body. So today, the, change, the world is definitely changed. But um, I think NBA uh, became like an all-star game uh, where defenses are not played. And, um, you know, numbers are, are pumped uh, unreasonably and people like it. It, people are paying for it. Different era. Uh, I, I, I don't care about that. Uh, you have to adjust to certain changes. Uh, the world, you know, is spinning and changing uh, for in a certain way. Some things are better, some things are not. I think NBA is not because the game of basketball was much better back, uh, back then. And um, the, the fans in, in the U.S. are disagreeing with me, definitely, but uh, that's my opinion. I think a lot, of people, a lot of people would agree with you. I prefer to watch uh, like a EuroLeague game than, than NBA. Like, I, I, I don't remember last time that I seen NBA. I see Boston because I'm emotionally connected. With them, I see games, uh, what they play, but uh, like this season, I haven't seen any. I, I didn't see in the finals last year. I didn't care because that, that's basketball that um, I don't like. Mm -hmm. Positionless basketball with centers shooting threes and... Uh, uh, yeah, and nobody's touching anybody. And, uh, you know, you can do whatever you want. You do 25 dribblings, it's all one against five. Harden is shooting uh, 53 is a game, uh, and they call that basketball. I, I don't like it. I really don't. Um, you mentioned, uh, let's go back to the Celtics really quickly. Um, you had, in, in 95, 96, you had your best NBA season, uh, averaging roughly 20 points and 10 rebounds, all-star numbers. Some of the local writers, local beat writers, took on the mission of deflating your numbers because you were playing uh, for a team with a losing record. So how much truth is that? How much truth was, was in that, in your opinion? And did you deserve to be in the All-Star game that year? I bet you whatever I have that if that, uh, that things is, uh, these things are happening today, I would be All-Star, you know, 
100%. In a row. Because, uh, you know, when, uh, when we came to NBA, uh, European players were, uh, were so much underestimated and uh, not cared about. And uh, it was really uh, hard playing there. So, uh, for example, you know, Luka Doncic, when he came to, to Dallas, they gave him the key of the city. And when I came to Boston, they gave me uh, the bag of, of uh, jerseys to carry from the bus uh, to hotel and uh, to washing room. Or Drajan to Portland, yeah. Yes, so um, I think that uh, back then these guys, uh, Drajan, uh, Sabonis, uh, Tony, Dio, as myself, we were like pioneers. And you know, it was very hard to pave the way, and now when the, the way is paved, it's much easier to, to ride. Mm. What do you think about the internationalization of the NBA in terms of uh, foreign players taking over the league? Uh, what's the reason behind it? I think 25-26% of the players right now are international. I think that uh, NBA is making a big mistake, first of all, with uh, allowing 19-year-old kids uh, coming to NBA. Not, they are not ready only as basketball players, but they are not ready as a human beings. You know, if you give a 19-year-old 50 or 100 millions in his pocket, his priorities in his life are changing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they cannot think, they cannot fight that. There are, there are a lot of, you know, families, friends around who are fake and, uh, and just trying to suck uh, money, time, focus out of them. And uh, then you have these guys from Europe who are, you know, more mature coming, you know, on, on the later stages um, and then uh, succeeding better than, uh, than Americans. Uh, but you have also these European guys who rush, like, uh, like Hezonia and Bender. They go there early at, at, uh, at young age and you cannot succeed there at young age. I mean, if you, if you look at, in the history of NBA, who succeed at the age of 19, not even Kobe Bryant when he came in the league, when he was uh, 18, he didn't uh, play for, for a couple of years. LeBron, yeah. maybe, the only one. LeBron, but, but how many players in, in the last 20 years did that? One or two. Yeah, so yeah, the numbers are small. I, I think their biggest mistake is uh, allowing, uh, you know, this one and done college guys. I think you should be at least three years, three, if not all four years. Mm. to come to NBA as, uh, as much more mature and grown men uh, to be able to, to, to lift the, um, the quality of, uh, <clears throat> of complete league. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I would have to agree. Uh, and the NBA is actually doing the complete opposite. I think they are kind of uh, uh, looking, looking to basically have high school kids come into the league Again, they're afraid they're gonna miss somebody, you know, mm -hmm. because you have these uh, kids that are really are good, mm -hmm. but still at the age of 18 or 19, they are not mentally ready. You mm -hmm. cannot, you cannot put them in a situation where they're all, all of a sudden have to be, uh, you know, leaders uh, because everybody expected to be a leader if you're number one uh, draft choice. And um, they're putting them in position they are not mature enough to to do it and, and, and you have many many situations where these number one two three picks uh, are gone from the league uh, soon. Um, you mentioned Luca briefly uh, did you ever envision him playing at a such high level uh, this early into his NBA career? I did but not this early uh, because this guy uh, at a very early uh, age showed a lot of maturity and you know he was uh, he's definitely a very talented guy and he worked a lot and um, i think he did good steps going to you know be, being um, uh, with the little minutes in real madrid to big minutes in real madrid winning in real madrid and then going to nba i didn't expect him to be as good in the first year i thought he needed maybe one more year in europe to to 
mature more more as a person than than as a basketball player. But um, he he surprised me. But you know he's definitely you know a great player and he's gonna get get a great career as long as he keeps working. You know you have to mm -hmm. so many games and so many um, challenges. Uh, you have to you know keep yourself focused not to get you know injuries and stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, is there perhaps a player that reminds you of Luca that played during your time? Somebody you would compare him with? I, he reminds me a lot uh, of Bodiroga. Mm -hmm. uh, a uh, faster uh, version of Bodiroga. <laughs> yeah, a little bigger. Yeah. A little bigger, uh, but uh, a guy with uh, huge balls and... Uh, Cajones. <laughs> Basketball talent, uh, huge basketball talent. Uh, what about you? Uh, is there any player in the NBA that reminds uh, you of you? I don't see today players that who can play with the back to the basket. I really don't. I have. I can uh, start thinking now and beat my head. Um, when 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 is the last time I see somebody put the ball down low and and. and Having a, like a um, dominant guy, not who can only score, but who can open things for the others, who can see the other side, who can see the open man, and who wants to pass to the open man. I, I really don't see that. Before it was a whole bunch of guys, uh, big guys who are, who are doing that. But today in NBA, I just don't see that. Do you see it coming back anytime soon? You know, traditional big man. I don't in know, am I going to be uh, alive enough to see? But <laughs> you know, as uh, as everything in a, in a, in the life, it goes you know up and down. So probably uh, one day he's going to come back. Mm -hmm. um, when you played for the Croatian national team, the team played on an elite level, winning several medals. Uh, the silver in Barcelona '92 being the most notable. Do you expect that we'll be seeing, you know, similar results with the creation team in the near future, given that we have so many NBA players? You know, uh, I think NBA players are not a guarantee of, uh, of uh, you know, medals and stuff because you have so many examples. And then in Europe, uh, last uh, period of time, a long period of time, 10, 15 years, you have many uh, national teams growing up and uh, obviously working good. Um, then you have many, uh, you know, with, with the split of, uh, of Yugoslavia and the split of uh, Russia, you have many more countries uh, where, where you have good schools, basketball schools and uh, good teams. So today uh, Europe is loaded with um, good basketball teams uh, and uh, it's much harder to to be as good as uh, we used to be before and, um, you know, uh, to win medals. Um, French team is improving a lot. The German team is improving a lot. Uh, you know, we have so many candidates to get today. Nobody, everybody knows how to play good basketball today. There's yeah, not a bad team in Europe. It's much harder than, um, than it used to be. You what know, we have to do, we have to make our league, uh, our domestic league stronger and uh, have the support cast because, you know, these extra talents we always had and we always will have. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we were lacking uh, lately is a uh, supporting cast and that's very important because today when you uh, look at the young players, you're always trying to find Rajan Tony or Dino, but um, you forget about the other guys uh, who are uh, as important as, as these as these superstars, you have to have a supporting cast that that can uh, you know um, widen your bench and uh, who can do some important roles each game. Different guy, so mm -hmm. that's something that uh, we are trying to do right now. Let's hope for the best. Um... Tony Kukoc is still not inducted in the Naismith uh, Hall of Fame. Do you expect him to be um, perhaps in the next, you know, class of uh, to 2021 or 22 or even later than I'm, that? I'm hoping really uh, because <clears throat> he deserves that. And, and um, I'm not too worried. You know, people, 
asking these questions every year, why is he not, why is he not, why is he not? But he is, he is just, you know. Depends when, yeah. The pool is huge and so many, you know, sharks are in. But he is definitely one of the biggest sharks, so he will be there very soon. Sure. I hope this year, I hope, really, I, I honestly want to see him over there. And um, he's the best player I ever played with. Uh, and uh, he's my friend, and uh, I, I wish to see him there, you know. Uh, it you played with him so many years, you grew up with him, uh, and then in the national team and in the NBA. Uh, can you perhaps share an anecdote uh, about Tony? Something maybe we haven't heard. You know, when I saw him first, he was like, uh, I don't know, like 45 kilos. <laughs> Altogether, he was very skinny, like uh, four toothpicks out of the little potato. <laughs> and... Um, you know, it was unbelievable back then, thinking that uh, e either of us uh, are going to do something seriously. But he's a great, great basketball mind, and uh, he's an unbelievable guy to play with, and uh, the easiest guy to play with. Um, what about Larry Bird? Larry stood beside you uh, in the... Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame introduced you uh, during the uh, Hall of Fame induction. Was he a mentor of yours during your time in Boston? And what's your uh, relationship like with him today? He was a guy uh, who, of course, everybody was looking up to. And uh, his career was over uh, before I came in. But 89, I was in Boston for three months. And uh, we had these mini camps that uh, we worked against each other and um, he of course had a lot of influence on, 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 on me watching NBA and following NBA and even wanting to go to Boston. And uh, when I uh, came they, there finally, he was still uh, living in Boston. He was coming to Boston on our practices and uh, even sometimes practicing with us when we had some injured players. And then when he went to Indiana, he wanted me to come and play for them. But um, we didn't cross paths uh, for some reason. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, and then when, um, when I got uh, information about Hall of Fame, I had to have somebody to, you know, introduce me. And uh, I was thinking, who is that going to be? And of course, uh, my first choice was uh, either some of my teammates, either either somebody from Boston. And uh, uh, I chose him. He accepted immediately. I was happy to do it and I'm happy he did it. It's amazing. It's, it's another big honor for me, you know, having him behind my back. Uh, Larry was an absolute beast. Uh, and there are so many amazing stories about him trash talk stories where he was actually able to talk a lot of trash but then back it up uh is there maybe a story from practice or a game you can share it's a piece of uh you know of game you know you you, you can't um, you can't uh, uh just uh, be a player if you don't have that kind of emotion you know and uh he was a guy who showed you that emotion and, and um, showed you that if you want to talk crap, that you have to back it up first. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, Dino, we have this segment we call the quick fire questions. So I'm just going to shoot, you know, some really quick questions and uh, you can answer them quickly. Sorry? How much time I have to think? Uh, well, yeah, let's, let's keep it. Within five seconds, maybe, huh? <laughs> okay, who is the GOAT? Michael Jordan, no question. Okay. Greatest international player of all time? Uh, Tony. Tony Kukoc. Best player in the NBA right now? Tatum. 
Okay, I didn't expect that. Uh, uh, you look a little bit further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my thinking. They are looking really good this year. Um, your favorite teammate? Tony. I'm assuming he best player you ever played with? Again, Tony? Yes. Uh, greatest accomplishment of your career? I would say uh, split decision between Munich uh, 89 and Barcelona 92. Okay. Uh, and this might be a longer one, but uh, it's a what if again. I know you don't like those, but uh, uh, if, Yugoslav if Yugoslavia hadn't split up, uh, Yugoslavia national team versus 92 dream team, Tony, Dražen, Divac, Zdovc, yourself, who wins? It's another hypothetical question, but uh, I think they win, mm -hmm. but not, uh, not for sure and not, uh, you know, but big margin. I think that game would be much closer because we would have much wider, you know, bench and uh, more possibilities. And with our style of playing, we, we, where we could, you know, calm them down and not uh, allowing them run and gun kind of game and then putting them five on five, I think it would be way more interested and um, way less predictable, especially. I think that, that that game would be decided in the last five minutes. Too bad we will never know. <laughs> uh, you versus Tony one on one, who would usually win? Oh, I beat him. <laughs> would you back him down back to the basket? <laughs> I you know. I everybody thinks he's the best. So of course, I think that too. Uh, I think I can match him with uh, with the quickness. I'm talking about best days, not today. <laughs> today I beat him even easier because he had a fake hip. <laughs> uh, um, I, I think back then I was uh, as fast as he was and uh, I was more powerful. So I would probably push him much, much easier than he could push me. That's great. <laughs> uh, all right, Dino, uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for your time. I wish you all the best in the future and uh, a really, you know, prosperous and peaceful uh, year. <laughs> Hopefully. The last one was ugly. Yeah. Thank you for Real coming pleasure. on the show. Thank you. Welcome.